Hey guys, it's Sam. Today we're going to talk about front surface toric gas permeable lenses. Um, a friend reached out on the channel and said they'd like some help with these specific types of gas permeable lenses. So this video is going to be geared strictly towards front surface toric lenses. Um, this channel, the information on it, is really always geared towards um, helping you pass your NCLE examination. So while I might add extra uh, points or interesting things around the topics that may not be on the NCLE, most of the material is kind of um, simplified to just illustrate what you'll need to know to pass the test. Because after, after all, that's probably why you're watching the channel. So just know that, you know, when I go through something like front surface toric, we're just going to cover some main points and some things that you'll um, find helpful in navigating through the questions on your examination. So a front surface toric lens has a spherical posterior surface, the surface of the lens closest to the eye, and it has a spherocylindrical um, anterior surface, right? So if that's our cornea, and this is the contact lens, so this is cylindrical, and then the posterior surface is spherical, right? And that's it makes sense, that's why we hear front surface toric. So what you need to know is that a bitoric lens has a toric anterior surface and posterior surface. That's why it's bitoric. A back surface toric lens has a spherical front surface and a toric back surface. Right. So the names of these lenses really define for us what they are. But a front surface toric, or you'll see it as anterior surface torque if they try to be fancy, right? So an anterior or front surface torque lens has the toric component, the cylindrical component on the front of the lens, and a spherical back surface. And what's really important to know about these lenses are they always require some sort of prism ballast to it, or it could be a peri ballast, or sometimes it's just a truncation, but it needs a stabilization method. Generally, it's going to be prism ballast. And I want to highlight that point for you to help this make sense. So we said that, you know, like a bitoric lens doesn't need a prism ballast. Or a back surface toric gas permeable doesn't need a prism ballast. And the reason being is that the, the back surface, the, the ocular surface, that central posterior curve has the cylindrical component on it. And you could think of it as like a reverse geometry because that toric surface is matching the toricity of the cornea, right? Because those meridians are going to line up and it's going to stop that lens from like moving around on the eye. A front surface toric doesn't have that luxury because the back surface, again, is going to be spherical. Like a spherical gas permeable lens, one that's not toric, just a spherical lens, it's okay if it rotates on the eye right? It's not a problem because it's just the same power throughout, right? It has the tear lens behind it, but that lens has the same power. So we're not going to have to use a prism ballast stabilization method or anything. Well, the same, so with front surface toric, it does matter if it rotates because it's a toric lens, but the toric cylindrical component is on the front of the lens. So it, it needs to stay stable. So, and to highlight this a little bit more, um, you know, if the cornea, let's say it's super steep cornea, then the toric lens, like a back surface toric, it's going to match match up with the toricity of the cornea. So it's not really going to be able to move around very much, right? It's going to kind of self-stabilize on the cornea. But if you have um, a somewhat spherical cornea and then a toric lens on it, it's gonna be able to move more, so we need to stabilize that. So the most common stabilization method with a front surface torque is called prism ballast. And what that is, is on the contact lens, it has a base down prism, usually at the six o'clock, and it's one and a half diopters typically, a base down prism. It can be between 0.75 and one and a half diopters, it's generally one and a half diopters. And what that does is it kind of weighs the lens down and just keeps it stable so it doesn't rotate. You could also have a peri ballast stabilization, 
where it's just they they keep it so that the prism doesn't encroach on the optical zone of the lens or you could even do a truncation which is where they just cut the bottom edge of the lens off uh, and that helps to stabilize it increases the lid interaction but what you need to know is that front surface torque gas permeables need some sort of stabilization to them um, bifocal gas permeables and multifocal gas permeables they also need stabilization back surface torque do not bitorque lenses do not spherical gas permeable lenses without a cylindrical component do not need stabilization so that's just something you want definitely want to remember so front surface torque you are going to use these when there's high residual astigmatism that is the key thing you want to remember so if you're if you're weighing through your options um, if you notice that there's high residual astigmatism or, or lenticular astigmatism, that's when you're going to think up oh, front surface torque. And I do have some videos that cover lenticular astigmatism and, and what residual astigmatism is. So if, if that's a, a topic that you really need some help on, just go through and, and watch some of those. Subscribe to the channel. Um, and, you know, I will be putting out new videos each week. But yes, uh, front surface torque, think high lenticular astigmatism. So the rules are, it has less than two and a half diopters of corneal astigmatism. I'll write that down. Less than 2.5 diopters of corneal. And then it has to have greater than 0.75 diopters of lenticular or residual. These are your rules for front surface torque. Um, another rule is that it can have, if it has more than like 10 to 15 degrees difference between the prescribed axis and the, um, the Ks, the K reading the axis between your strongest and your weakest power, then you're also going to consider a front surface torque. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit in another minute or so. But, so front surface torque, less than two and a half doctors of corneal astigmatism. And I will say on, on the test, they're not going to give you one with like two and a quarter diopters. It's going to be so obvious. It's going to be like a half a diopter of corneal astigmatism or 0.75 diopters of corneal astigmatism. They're going to highlight the fact that there's a lot of residual astigmatism. So there's going to be, you know, it might be two diopters of, of lenticular astigmatism and a half a diopter of corneal astigmatism. So I want to go through an example with you just to show that. Okay, so I'm going to write down a prescription it's already in minus cylinder form but remember that's the first thing you're going to want to do put it in minus cylinder form compensate for vertex distance and then you can start working with these um, let me write some k readings down let's do 44 75 okay so here's just an example we can look at and kind of learn from. First, let's look at our Ks. We have 44 at 180, 44, 75 at 90. So the amount of corneal astigmatism is the difference between our, our flattest and our steepest meridian. So corneal astigmatism is 0.75 diopters. What else do I want to glean from this? Um, we see our steepest power. 44.75 is steeper than 44, so our steepest is at 90. That's with the rule of astigmatism. Does that make sense? Well, if we look at our prescription, if we transpose that, you know, we get negative three and a quarter at 90. Yeah, it's taking more minus power to neutralize our steeper cornea at 90, so it all, it's all making sense. But then we see here, the refraction shows 175, minus 175 in it, and our corneal astigmatism is 0.75. So we see a low corneal astigmatism. We have one diopter of lenticular astigmatism, or um, uh, so residual astigmatism, residual astigmatism. So, and we get that by comparing the 0.75 and the 1.75 the difference is one diopter. So that's saying that this patient more than likely, um, they're showing 0.75 diopters difference in the steepness of the cornea, but then inside their eye in the crystalline lens, they have an additional one diopter 
of astigmatism that's giving them that complete 175. So this example falls within our parameters. Um, so we would use a front surface torque for it because there's a higher amount of lenticular astigmatism. I'm going to do another example along those lines. Let's use the prescription negative one, negative three at 180. So negative one, negative three at 180. Let's use the K readings 44 at 180, 44, 50 at 90. Okay, so again, our prescription's in minus cylinder form. If we were to compensate for vertex distance on this, you know, I'm gonna draw this out, it'll be a great learning example. On our 180, you see the power is negative one. On our 90 degree, you have negative four. If we compensate for vertex distance, we can make that a negative 375. Remember, four diopters is the entry point for compensating for vertex distance. So, so we, and all lenses become more plus or less minus when they're on the eye, like with contact lenses. So if we take this off the optical cross, you've got negative one, keep your axis at 180. You ask yourself, how far does it take to get from a one to a 375? That'd be negative 275. So we lose a quarter diopter of cylinder there. But again, in our example, 44 at 180, 4450 at 90, we have a half a diopter of corneal astigmatism. Obviously, that's not correcting all of our astigmatism because we have 2.75 diopters of um, total refractive astigmatism. So the difference there is two and a quarter. It's primarily lenticular astigmatism, primarily um, going to be residual astigmatism. So you're going to consider a front surface toric lens. They're not that difficult um, in selecting what type of lens to choose if you know your rules, right? So front surface torque, we said, um, you know, you want less than two and a half diopters of corneal astigmatism. You want at least, you know, 0.75 or higher in residual astigmatism. Back surface torque, remember, there's a specific ratio you want to use with that. So you want the corneal astigmatism to be about two thirds of the total astigmatism. That's the only time that um, a back surface torque is applicable. So if you have, you know, four diopters of corneal astigmatism and six diopters of refractive astigmatism, you'd think, okay, that would work, two thirds back surface torque. Um, and then you have a bitorque. Bitorque, just think, whoa, there's a lot of corneal astigmatism. That's a red flag um, that you're gonna wanna go with the bitorque lens. So I also said that with a front surface torque, um, you would also consider it when there's more than 10, 15 degrees of difference between your refractive astigmatism and your K readings. So let me put an example of that. 150 minus one quarter, X is 180. So let's say our K readings are 44 at 18. And you know, 44, 87, ooh, that's ugly at what would be 108. All right, so it's 90 degrees, 18 to 108. Um, so what we see here, so at 44 at 18, believe it or not, that's 4487 at 108. So what is our corneal astigmatism? Um, we're gonna say that's 0.87 difference. So our refractive astigmatism is one and a quarter. So what is the difference of the, the amount of residual astigmatism between those 0.87 to, to 1.25 is 0.37. Okay, 0.37 is not a lot of residual astigmatism. You generally would not consider that with the front surface torque. However, we have to remember that um, when an axis shifts, the power of the lens will shift, right? So the fact that the axis here goes from an 18 um, at our flattest meridian, 44 is flatter than 44.87, to 180 at our flattest meridian, 
The difference is 18 degrees. Again, we said that, you know, 10 to 15 degrees is the textbook rule. On the test, you're going to see greater than that. They're going to make it obvious. So if, you're, if your astigmatism amounts are similar, but you notice that the axis is completely different, what that's telling you is that, yeah, even though there's a similar amount of astigmatism, it's not lining up properly. So you're going to need that front surface torque to take care of it because it's not going to be, if you correct just for the corneal astigmatism, you still have that difference um, that's going to be lenticular. Probably like a, a subluxation of the lens inside the eye where the lens can shift can cause something like that. But it's, it's regular astigmatism. They're both 90 degrees apart. It's not irregular, but there's a difference between your corneal, uh, what your K readings are measuring, and what your um, refractive astigmatism is. So that's, a, that's a side note. You may not receive a question that intricate on your test, but it's good to know. Primarily, like I said, remember, if you can remember that high residual astigmatism, to think front sur surface torque, you'll be in pretty good shape. There's one last thing I want to mention about front surface torque lenses, which is really interesting, is that if you're using um, your radius scope, your microspherometer, and you're measuring the base curve of your lens, right? So that's, um, so you got your contact lens, it's in some water, some saline, and you're measuring it with your microspherometer radius scope. So typically for a spherical lens, you'll see this when you measure the base curve. All of the Myers will come into focus at the same time. With a bitorque lens, with a back surface torque lens, this will not happen. You'll have um, the either the perpendicular um, or your horizontal meridian or the oblique meridian will come into focus. Then you'll turn the knob 90 degrees away. Uh, the opposite one will come into focus. With a spherical gas permeable, they'll all come into focus for your radius of curvature measurement. But also with a front surface toric, you'll get the same thing where all the Myers come into focus at the same time because it's reading the back surface of the lens and the back surface of a front surface toric lens is spherical. So that's a good, good thing to know. It's an easy test question. Um, it'll say this lens reads with a spherical, you know, all the Myers come clear on the on the uh, radius scope at the same time, but in the lensometer, it reads spherocylindrical. What type of lens is this? Well, it's reading the power of the lens in the lensometer reads with a sphere and a cylinder component because it's toric, but on the radius scope, the back surface, because it's read from the back vertex distance, is going to read um, where all Myers come in clear at the same time. Again, you know, your bi torque and your back torque, you're, they're going to come in clear at separate times. So I hope this video has been helpful. Hopefully it elucidated, shed some light on the front surface torque lens. Again, if you have any comments um, or any questions or, or want me to do a specific topic, please, uh, please comment on the video. I do appreciate you subscribing to the channel, telling your optician friends to subscribe to the channel. That, uh, that definitely helps and motivates and, and keeps me producing some content. So thank you all and I'll see you next time.